afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Sync Tech Hawaii. Welcome one and all. Adaptive reuse. What in the world is adaptive reuse? In this case, it refers to buildings that have expired their original intent. And very often they're just sitting abandoned and neglected. And instead of tearing that building down and building a new one, why not breathe new life into that old building? That's what our guest of the day is all about. But what am I, a Hawaii energy person, doing talking about adaptive reuse? Well, think about it. When you build a building, you had to mine all that steel, glass, cement, and then more energy to erect the building, tremendous amounts of energy. And then if you tear it down, there's more energy, you dispose of the rubble, that's more energy. And then you build a new building, that's even more energy. Why not practice adaptive reuse, where you ask, what good use would this building be now in this neighborhood and you adjust accordingly and make it into a commercial, commercially viable, brand spanking new use with brand spanking new equipment in it. So Linda Mickey, principal of G70, one of the largest architectural firms in all of Honolulu, is a specialty specialist in this field. And she thinks not just of adaptive reuse, but of redemption. The building has committed the sin of getting old and useless, and she redeems it to an entirely new life. So welcome, Linda Mickey. So glad to have you on board. Thank you, Howard. I, mm -hmm. I, I love the way you describe redemptive. <laughs> so you have four projects to describe and each one of them is entirely a different ball game. This is gonna be so fascinating. And we've got a lot of material to cover. So why don't you get into Kupu at first, Linda, take it away. Okay, terrific. So if we can show the first slide, um, I wanted to share a few projects that really show the breadth of adaptive reuse. And so the first slide is looking at Kupu, and it was originally designed as a net and canoe shed. Um, and unfortunately, over time, it got used into a, a, basically a miscellaneous storage unit. And um, what Kupu did is they had a vision and they wanted to create a community center and a training center for some of their students. And so really what we're talking about is how do you open your eyes to see things so that you can actually have visions of how we can reuse buildings versus tearing them down and building new ones? Because I really think that that is going to be the way that we are going to be um, a sustainable community. And um, the you know, next... where, where is Kupu? Where is this building located? Um, it's near Ala Moana on, on the the basin. So it has beautiful, I mean, it's near the ocean. So it has beautiful ocean sunsets. It's just a great community place. We've had our office um, uh, Christmas parties there and the students there um, cook fabulous food. I mean, so it all around, they have a great program. Um, it's a great venue and it's an open air place um, to really um, bring community in. And, and we love um, just the the mission that they have and the vision they have, but also that it's taking something that was really unused and bringing life back to it. And that's the exciting thing about adaptive reuse. It's taking something and bringing new life by bringing people to it. Maybe you could show this slide again and, and point to what examples of what's going on in there. Well, um, a couple of the, you know, the little sketch is just showing how it was a net shed, it became a storage, mm -hmm. and then now it's a community center with sort of a, a kind of open air plaza. Uh -huh. And that's just a couple of pictures of before and after, and um, really um, at their opening. And it has an artwork uh, done by uh, Ka'ili Chan, 
one of our in-house artists and it it's it's a beautiful place to be it's um naturally ventilated and it's a great um venue and it's it's a small project but that's why i'm trying to share that you know if you go to the next slide you can have adaptive reuse in all kinds of sizes of projects. Um, for example, this, this picture is actually of our um, new office. We've moved in a couple of years ago and it used to be the old um, Bank of Hawaii main branch. And they had a huge um, branch that took up the whole first floor. And this, this space actually wasn't even on the, um, it wasn't even available for, for leasing. But one of my partners and I were in, um, we had just toured uh, some office space and it was kind of in the tower. And we went into the main branch and there's this beautiful two-story, um, two-story spaces. There wasn't a connection to the mezzanine at the time. And we were just kind of ideating and I was telling her, you know, I really would love to have the office in this space. So we came up with a crazy proposal. We presented it to Peter Ho and he liked it. And um, he made it happen because really it was taking into account the new way people are banking. So they don't need as many teller spaces. It's really like kind of bringing it up to the current, um, you know, electronic means of how a lot of people do their banking. And so it worked out perfectly timing wise because they actually used the half of the branch bank that our office is in while they renovated the other half of the building for their new branch. And then the last thing they did is they had a filming of Hawaii Five O as the Bank of Oahu. And that was the last use of that sort of um, bank branch on that side. But you yeah, know, there's a lot of things that we reused in the bank that people don't really notice either. Um, you know, one of the things is they had these beautiful four by four um, ceiling tiles and they were fabulous and you don't, you can't find um, that type of ceiling tiles any longer and they were original. And so we reused them, which was great. And they had a, another beautiful, really large um, filing uh, storage. And so the contractor figured out how to um, uh, almost like Flintstone Egyptian roller on rollers to roll this large cabinet to our storage area. So we we actually reused a lot of things that were beautiful and um, still viable. But you know, one of the new things we added was a big stair going up to the mezzanine. And at first, the mezzanine looked very low because they had kind of long, long low lights and by removing them and changing the light fixtures to the new upgraded light fixtures it really kind of opened the space and we actually opened the ceiling so we have a part of our second floor ceiling that's open um, to the mechanical ducting and it just really feels a lot more open and inviting and so it's really just trying to take um, the time to look at things a little differently on how we can um, reuse which is very you're sustainable. Saving, you're saving a heck of a lot of energy along the way, Linda. The Hawaii exactly. State Energy Office and the governor thanks you so much for that. <laughs> you're welcome. So the next project I wanted to share was um, the Aloha Tower Marketplace. Could we show that? Yeah. So HPU, Hawaii Pacific University, had this great vision in their master plan to have an anchor to their downtown um, campus. And the Aloha Tower Marketplace had been in, um, uh, you know, somewhat um, low occupancy, especially on the second floor. Um, second floor retail is very challenging. And so um, what we uh, partnered with HPU is to create um, dormitory lofts. So we were able to fit in two-story dormitories on the second floor of the Aloha Tower Marketplace. And the nice thing about it is that we really got a chance to um, show um, some really um, interesting spaces. If you could go to the next slide. So we, we had some very interesting and unique 
dorm rooms. Um, so they had living areas. And we even re, um, reutilized some of the, um, they had some roll-up doors. And so if you notice on the right um, bottom picture, that's an existing, those are all existing storefronts. So we did a really kind of an interesting thing in reutilizing the storefronts by putting in um, uh, decorative um, patterning on our um, window film for privacy and reutilizing some of the really kind of neat um, storefront areas that um, we could in order to um, give it sort of that industrial and also um, urban, um, urban feel for the downtown campus. So that was actually um, a, a slightly larger project and the downstairs actually had some of the um, uh, multi-purpose areas for the university. And so that they actually then had a gathering place for them to come together and use. So the next project I wanted to share a little bit more detail about is an old iconic building. Um, you can go to the next slide. And I don't know if you remember this, it's the Waikiki Trade Center. It was built in 1980. So it had some very iconic circular windows. So I think in Waikiki, if you're driving by on Pujillo, you'll see an old um, iconic tower that um, was built with um, the intent to be offices. So they had um, offices, they had parking, and they had retail. And um, one of the interesting things about this project was it was a really good adaptive reuse um, for basically um, the needs because there weren't enough at that time um, in 2014, there really weren't enough um, hotel rooms. And so this was also to meet a need, but um, the other thing is that offices in Waikiki were not in high demand. So the, the building itself had come into um, some disrepair because it was pretty much almost 50% vacant. So, you know, highly underutilized building. So um, I'll go into a little bit more details about how, to, how we went about doing this. But one of the first things we did, you can go to the next slide, is we actually, um, tried to make the um, hotel have its own identity and entrance off of Seaside, where the existing Port Cochere was. So the hotel was not necessarily related to the retail space that we um, modified. One of the most important things for a hotel use was to check on the ventilation. Because it's a change in use from office to hotel, there's several requirements that change um, ventilation, we had to make sure that we could still reuse the existing curtain wall and that we also um, were able to get enough of the um, sewer connection for the added bathrooms and, and you know, water needed for the um, restaurant and other areas. So you can go to the next slide, please. This is one of the um, areas that are while well, it was under construction. And so remember I was telling you about kind of having new eyes to think about things and, and to see how we could really transform the space. So they had a really large roof deck. And so we had envisioned actually creating a kind of like a, a, a semi sky lobby. So on you you'd go up to the eighth floor and you would enter into an expanse of lobby and bar and it would open up to the pool deck, which we put on the existing roof that was underutilized. You can go to the next slide. So this is a picture of the, um, the new lobby. And um, it really was a transformation because we took a portion of the um, existing window glazing and we actually put in open um, doors so that it flowed out and opened into the new um, pool area. So if you go to the next slide, 
you can see um, sort of the unusual configuration of the tower itself as well. So I think we had, I don't know, something like 20 something different unit types because of the unusual configuration of the building, we had to be creative on how we got guest rooms in there. And so um, because of the deep space, we ended up getting some very um, gracious, large um, guest rooms on areas where uh, maybe the view wasn't as nice, but you'd have, you had a really large kind of a, a guest room for, for them to enjoy. So part of the challenges um, that occurred as well, you can go to the next slide. Was when we were looking at the existing pool deck, one structurally we had to figure out how we were going to reinforce the structure to be able to to um, carry the pool water. Um, also, there was um, another wind factor involved, and um, really, if you look at it before, it was really a very large underutilized space, and we didn't even use the whole roof. We only used a portion of it that was sort of protected by the tower. Um, from the wind. And so um, it was a very fun project in, in trying to create a really nice environment and space for people to come and have a little oasis for them to enjoy uh, when they came back from their day's um, ventures. I think you can go to the next slide. So these are just some examples of the different types of guest rooms. And one of the beautiful things about this adaptive reuse is that the office building already had fabulous views of the ocean. You could see um, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, the ocean beyond, um, and we really um, enjoyed um, sort of celebrating the circular windows because there's something special about looking through any view through a circular window. I don't know what it is, Howard, but it just makes it feel special. It, it's, it like frames it and it makes it feel very special. So uh, we had a lot of fun with, with that as well. Go to the next slide. So um, this shows you some of the, the rooms and um, some of the very kind of interesting uh, circular uh, windows that we had as well there. So on the ground floor, that is where we had some very interesting um, retail um, adventures. And so the next slide shows the before and after. Um, on the top, you'll see the floor plan before, and it had a very large um, atrium that um, ran through the retail space. So in a way, you had um, retail that, that was internal to the, um, the atrium area. Now, at the time when it was built, it was um, very classic um, 1980s. It had um, sort of metallic, um, uh, finishes on the round columns and um, they had a lot of nightclubs and, and discos during that time. And so unfortunately, the, the metal on the columns and the cladding took its toll and there were a lot of fist, uh, fist images and, you know, people who had punched it. So it was, it was quite beaten up by the youth. And I think this transformation for the community was that it, it changed the environment. Um, and this was happening all along Pujillo Avenue. It was like, you know, this was a time when there was a real revitalization going on on Pujillo Avenue with International Marketplace, just the whole street. And I believe it really changed the environment and the community. And people then were able to come out and enjoy things with their family. Um, so if we could go back to that slide, um, what we had looked at doing was to separate the, um, the hotel entrance, which is that little orange small piece, and the retail along Pujillo to really help to celebrate what was going on. Um, 
this also had a large um, second floor tenant. And so um, Charters Larching and um, Colswood um, Capital Group, they really did a great job on really looking for tenants that were um, fabulous tenants. And so they basically um, leased out pretty much all of their tenant space. So the interesting thing is that Nordstrom Rack, which is there, and they take up the whole second floor, they had an interesting um, concept because we needed to provide a, a two-story entry to get up to um, Nordstrom Rack and to create a facade that would sort of open up and um, give that, that feel of that two-story space. So, um, one of the things that was um, also, you can go to the next slide. So one of the things that we had to do was, um, if you look at the upper left-hand picture, it shows part of the demolition of some of the large concrete beams. And they had three large circles that ran across the front facade. And um, that is actually the, the structure behind the Nordstrom facade that you see um, currently. And Nordstrom had actually opened before the hotel. So part of the other strategic planning we had to do was to actually run all of the plumbing lines, everything that would go through the tenant space, we had to have that actually planned and installed before the tenant took over the space. So there was a lot of logistics um, and it was um, actually quite, quite a challenge to um, keep, keep the project going as well as they kept all of the parking available and open during construction. So during the year and a half of construction, everyone still was able to access the parking garage because I guess parking is very valuable in Waikiki. So they ended up keeping it open and available um, for everyone to use. And so what we ended up doing is to really get the best out of this um, property. We um, cleaned up the front facade and there were several reasons for doing that. One is uh, when, you're, when you're doing a renovation, it's really important to upgrade um, to what's needed. And so if you go back to the... Um, slide that we were looking at earlier. So one of the pictures in the middle is actually showing the floor infill. And our structural engineers had to be very savvy on how they figured out how to do this because one of the really important things is that the, um, the intent was we were trying to minimize any new foundation or footings. Um, because in Waikiki, there's a lot of um, archaeological um, survey and inventory that we have to do. And so even um, digging for the elevator pit was something that we had to take care of very early on with the um, cultural surveys to make sure that um, we didn't find anything, even though it was previously disturbed, there was nothing that was found. And even when we planted the coconut trees outside, so we were very careful on how we did the infill of the atrium. Um, and we were able to actually offset some of the retail space with the unused um, floor area underneath the new pool. And so we really took um, actually square footage that was underutilized under the pool and moved it to the um, retail space so that they could really maximize the um, retail square footage that they had on Kuhio Avenue. So in that other photo, um, one of the other things I wanted to show was that we actually had hidden in the corners in front of the Nordstrom building, little um, corner, um, let me see, one of the, the lower left corner picture, it shows a, one of the corners of the, um, of the stone and it it's actually to receive um, a special type of um, flood barrier um, gate 
And so we actually had installed in all of the entries flood barriers so that you would have these flood barriers that they could put in front of the doors. And flood barriers almost work opposite from fire exiting. So in fire exiting, you want people to be able to run out of the building quickly. But when you put up flood barriers, they want to keep the building protected from the floodwaters from getting in. So the, so the elevation is carefully designed so that the doors can still open. But should there be a flood, you can keep the floodwaters out. And it, it comes up to maybe almost three feet high on the flood barriers. And so it's just really interesting because there's a lot of um, interesting challenges that you also have to do when you do an adaptive reuse in bringing up the building to current code and systems. Okay, next slide. We've got about two minutes, Linda. Okay, thank you. So that's just the facade with the hidden flood barriers that hopefully we'll never have to see. And um, the last thing and in closing, the last slide is really a lot of adaptive reuse is how we rethink about things and bringing people back into the space and bringing life to the new buildings that we already have. So it's like bringing new life into every building. So I hope everyone will keep their eyes open for some creative thoughts and ideas. Wow. Thank you so much, Linda. If you notice, I didn't butt in at any time because you're such a great storyteller. <laughs> You just really, you flow so smoothly there. And just to, to me, from what I saw, the best example of adaptive reuse is the Aloha Tower space. I used to go up to that second bottom floor. Aside oh. from, uh, there was the, the brewery there that was active, but everything else was pretty well dead. And then the heart of downtown, that's almost a sin. Now you've got all these college kids living there and all that space, the meeting space on, on the ground floor. Well, and then they still have the restaurant, which was great. I mean, that was the other thing is we renovated around the restaurants that were already in place. And wow. so a lot of the restaurants remained. Um, and, you know, Aloha Tower also has some of the boats and other things that, um, mm -hmm. so they still remain. And, and pretty much for most of these renovations, you have tenants who are there, you need to schedule and plan around. But really, in the end, um, as I was telling you, you know, sometimes it's, it's very um, uh, hairy when we're walking through and when, you know, my, my shoes get stuck to the floor, it, it kind of grosses you out. But when you see the transformation in the end and people enjoying the space, that's really what it's all about. And yeah, and the concept of underutilized space in the heart of Waikiki. What a contradiction. And can you imagine exactly. the value of a square foot in there? And here you go revitalizing it, bringing the people back in. Wow, I am so impressed, Linda, that we have run out of time. So I thank you very, very, very much. And come back again when you have I don't think any new projects can be this exciting, but you're, I know you're working on new things. Oh, thank you, thank Howard, you. for having me. <laughs> appreciate it. This has been a whole lot of fun. And bidding fond farewell, this is Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. See you next time and bless you for your work, Linda. <laughs>